is something I have wanted to talk about for a while, and that is the hexagonal architecture. And why I am using it today in pretty much all my applications, even though it's a small application or even a big application. And the reason is that it makes coding easier. It makes so that I don't have to worry too much about how I do it, instead of fo and I can instead focus on the business logic of that. And if you don't know what business logic means, it just means that the core behavior of the application, like that, that you want to happen, you know, the basic, the main functionality you care about, which is not the details. And the way the pattern works is we have several concerns. We have adapters, we have application layer, we have a domain layer, and we have the infrastructure, or we may or may not have infrastructure. Since I'm using Spring Boot in my application, I'm using the infrastructure in order to organize the uh, uh, Spring-dependent classes, such as uh, uh, problem handling, uh, some properties, which, uh, some security stuff. Uh, and all of those use Spring Boot are, and are tightly coupled with Spring Boot. However, the application part of it, the business logic uh, of our code is not coupled at all with Spring Boot. It has zero dependencies with Spring Boot. It on, its only concern is itself and how it will behave. Now, the domain is just the language of the code. So when you're talking about an account, you're always talking about this account. When you're talking about the role, you're talking about the role and so on and so on. Uh, it allows you, the developer, speak with the uh, business people in your organization because they may set the rules of the business. So when you have, for example, they may say, you know, when people create their new accounts, we want to make sure their status is set to inactive. So we're talking about the account and we're talking about the status with the role, uh, with the status inactive, which may be active, you know. And in that case, you would then create a use case for that scenario. So when you create an account, we want to make sure its status is set to one or the other. So for example, here we have a use case called register account use case. And all it does is concern itself about that one thing. When we register a new account, we want to validate the account. And that account is its own DTA, DTO. We have specifically a DTO for this specific use case, and that makes so we don't messes we don't mess up with other use cases. Too often in code, you see multiple use cases, which may or may not be identified as a use case, but they are. It's two or more different scenarios which use the same DTOs is something you probably see a lot. And what happens is, if I were to instead of using a DTO in this case, in this business use case and instead use an account, I would have no idea what I really wanted in that use case. There is no way for me using this account as a data transference object, uh, you know, input uh, object into that function to know that I only want this or that without looking into the code and seeing, okay, I want this and that. However, if you define own DTOs for every single use case, no exception, you will always know what you need to enter and what may or may not be optional. Now in this case, we require a display name, an email and a password, which means there's no room for miscommunication. They may not accidentally send in a, a status, for example. They cannot send a status, in, in fact, which we wouldn't use anyway in this uh, scenario when we register a new account. Uh, and that makes change easier. When you have a DTO specifically for a use case, it makes it so that you don't have to change multiple uh, classes when you make a change, which you will do at some point in pretty much all use cases. And some use cases may be very similar, and you may think that, ah, you might as well reuse the object, and you may, you may or may, you may not. Uh, even if they are similar, I wouldn't use the same DTO object because every use case is different. So having a specific DTO for this specific use case, we are able to ensure the rules are followed from within the use case. We're not exposing our own use case outside our use case. So when we create a new account, we want to make sure it doesn't exist. If it does exist, we're going to log a warning and we're going to throw a API uh, problem code, which will inform the end caller that the account already exists. And how you handle that in front end, uh, not so important here. However, 
once you have passed the final test, you are ready to create your account. And that account is built together from the DTO. You're setting the default values, which if our business told us we want to set status as inactive when you register, we would change it here. No other place in the entire code. And you set default roles, and that default role may or may not change in the future. So we have a own function for that, and this may even be taken a step further and put into a configuration which is loaded on startup. Uh, however, you may even, yeah, there are many ways to do things. <laughs> and then we set the password. This is an encrypted password which we receive from the uh, account DTO's uh, get password, and this ensures that we we don't you know we're not storing passwords at plain text because that would be stupid. And there are big companies that have done that. Big companies that have leaked. Uh, enough about that. Uh, so at last, you then register a new account uh, in the account repository. So if I jump into this account repository, you will see it's just an interface. It doesn't do anything. And that's the great part. When you're working on this use case, you don't need to implement the how you do it. You just want to implement that this is what's supposed to be done. And you may think, hey, that's crazy talk. How can I how can I test this? How can I make this work? Well, if you're testing this, you should be marking this anyway. You will be verifying that this call, this method is receiving an account with these values. That's how you would test it. You wouldn't actually need this implementation in your test unless you're doing an integration test. But that should happen later. So how, how do we solve that then? How, how can I possibly make this work when you have interfaces here and and, and here and uh, so many interfaces? Like, what the hell? How does that work? Well, the thing about the hexagonal, hexagonal, hexagonal architecture pattern is that we have layers. We don't implement the details in our business. We don't care about how you implement the details and that's the key and that's the joy of this pattern because we don't care any about anything i love not caring so when you get to the part that okay now i gotta make this work you know okay i, I gotta I gotta find a way to uh, to do these things i gotta register an account i gotta find an account by email i gotta update the account and and these do share different use cases we here we have two uses of registry a new account for example we have four uses of find account by email but only one implementation of each of them and we may or may not have more so how does that work well the adapters is what implements our business the details that is and we have two types of adapters we have ingoing adapters which will be graphql it will be the web rest api and so on anything that en enables us to start the process you know, that goes into the application and makes something happen. And then we have the adapter out. That is what we use. That's what the business account expects to be using, such as a GPI, J JPA storage, or storing something into a database, which means the database is a detail, which means it's not coupled to our business. We don't know about a database ID in our business logic. We don't care about that either. But you may ask, how can I then get you know the specific account? Well, if we go to our domain and account, we know that our email is unique. We cannot have multiple accounts with the same email. Now I should probably have, or I might have edited this with some unique or something. I don't know. But that's some that's some improvement that can be done in the future probably. Uh, but anyway. The way our business handles this is that we use our email to fetch the specific accounts, which means uh, in the implementation you may want to index that email so you can search for it faster. So for example, in the repository here, the interface, we see that when we want to find an account, we used our email. So we need to implement that by whatever detail we want to shoot, you know, pick, which is GPA in this case and returns an optional account. So going to our account JPA repository adapter, which implements the account repository as well as use detail service apparently, we have a find account by email, which takes in the email. 
we then use our account GPI, GPA repository, which is a Spring repository component, which extends CRUD repository and which does the thing. It finds by email, takes in an email and returns an optional. And the account GPA, you may have noticed, is its own implementation of the account. This is not coupled to the account. It's completely separate. We have a wall between them. We don't, we don't we don't expose the account GPA with the business logic. This account GPA exists solely within the outadapter.gpa area. So in adapters and out adapters don't share dependencies. Uh, adapters may depend on business and domain, but not the other way, which means the application only depends on itself and the domain layer, nothing else. I think that's it in a nutshell i could probably go more into this and if you have questions please uh, let me know <laughs>